seeing that we now have a quorum, the time is now 516. We will now call the regular public meeting of the Board of Trustees of Humble Independent School District to order. Moving to our first item of business, closed session. The time is now 7.08 p.m. We will now reconvene into open session. Uh, our first order of business is questions and comments by patrons or employees of the district regarding agenda items or any other matters. Do we have any public comment tonight? No. Not seeing any? Perfect. So let's move right on to item number four, information items. This brings us to our board workshop, bond program and update. Uh, Dr. Fagan, I'm going to turn it over to you then. Thank you so much. We are very excited to uh, share this update with all of you and the community regarding our 2018 bond program. So you all probably remember uh, back in the fall of 2017, I think that's right, right? I always get confused on these. The fall of 17, um, we brought together the Citizens Bond Advisory Committee. And we had recently com um, completed that summer the facility assessment for the entire school district. Uh, PBK Architects partnered with our operations division and all of the other departments and created a facility assessment. And um, about, I think it was about $1.2 billion worth of stuff. And the Citizens and Bond Advisory Committee came together, uh, lots of folks from our community, to evaluate the items in the facility assessment and really make a recommendation uh, to the board about what they felt was important for us to move forward to a potential uh, bond package. And uh, this is an important part of our process because Umbel ISD is a family. It's a community, uh, business community, parent community, staff, students, uh, and others who all come together and worked for the best interest of our students. And so this committee uh, is just representative of that culture that we have and an important part of our process. So the board did indeed, as you know, put a $575 million uh, item on the ballot, May of 2018, which passed 74% of our community in favor. And we were so proud of this for a number of reasons. Um, but you probably remember that we had uh, endured Hurricane Harvey, and it was a very challenging time. Uh, but at the same time, uh, folks came together and really appreciated the, the future that Umbel ISD wanted to have. So sometimes when you pass a bond, folks think, oh, this is great. We just passed $575 million, and tomorrow there will be all these new schools all over the place, and that is going to be so exciting. But the reality is that is not how a bond program works. And instead, uh, we had to start com um, back at the beginning because we wanted to make sure that all of our uh, practices were sound and that our plan was uh, quality. And so we actually procured an all-new architect and uh, engineering pool. We also uh, took that list of uh, over a billion dollars in items and figured out, uh, in addition to the major projects selected by the uh, Citizens Bond Advisory Committee and the board, what other items needed to move forward and in what sequence, because part of what we pro promised the community was that we would not raise the tax rate. And so although the bond was approved, we had to make sure that we were only selling bonds uh, in a way that would maintain a tax rate. Taxpayers enjoy stable taxes, and we absolutely wanted to provide that. It was a commitment we made. We had to sequ sequence the projects in a certain order, and then uh, we get started. So we purchase land, we select architects, we do design work, begin groundbreaking, and then voila, that fancy school does pop up. Um, one of the things that is unique about this program I want to mention here is that sometimes when you have a bond program, you really turn it over to the architects and the engineers and you say, there you go, we need an elementary school, go get them. And, um, but Umbel ISD took a little different approach here because we wanted to maximize every dollar for our students and the learning that they were going to have in these facilities by making sure that experts in PVC pipe were paired with end users and educators, folks who were going to use these spaces uh, every day. And so that is a unique aspect of this program. Every single uh, major project has a committee of folks who are both construction experts as well as educational experts. And these are just uh, a number of those items that contribute to the timelines that are sometimes misunderstood that you have to make sure you go through a process uh, for, the, for every single project. And, uh, and 
going through that process takes time. So people are wondering, how's it going? Um, it's sort of a joke right now in my office. There's 14 shovels against the wall behind my computer because, as this board knows, we've been to a number of groundbreakings, and um, that's great news. Uh, a couple of things that have happened have really allowed us to move our projects forward quickly, and we were very proud to break ground on all of those that are listed on the right of this particular slide. And we have done all of this with no tax increase as promised. In fact, as you can see on this slide, since uh, 2000, our tax rate has actually decreased. And we're very proud of the tax rate that uh, we have and that we continue to maintain. The other thing that happened is, is the COVID economy or the pandemic. And a lot of folks in the spring got nervous about what implications there would be for COVID as far as work environments go and you know, what, what should happen. And so they kind of slowed down a little bit. But what we noticed was that the cost of supplies and materials was going down, interest rates were going down, and frankly, contractors uh, were really eager to work. They wanted to make sure that throughout the pandemic, uh, their folks on their teams had, uh, had jobs and that they could maintain their payroll every day. And so we saw incredible construction groups coming in, bidding on our projects and giving us great pricing. When we started to see that happening, our team ramped up our processes. We moved things forward uh, much faster in order to maximize every dollar given to us by the community. Our bond is, is really uh, in three main categories. The first one is safety, and uh, you'll recognize some of these uh, security vestibules that have been uh, built and implemented at many of our campuses. Uh, we have also implemented a lot of HVAC improvements, and some people might say, I'm not really sure how that's safety, but in a COVID world, the ability to lower set points and exchange air more often, have better filters and uh, filtration systems is really important to maintaining quality air and not passing uh, viruses around. So beyond COVID, we're excited about the fact that our, bu our buildings will have uh, these systems in places, including bipolar ionization, uh, UV lights, and MERV-13 filters well into the future, keeping our staff and students safe. We also added turf uh, at four of our high school campuses. Uh, turf is a safety issue, as well as uh, less grass to water and mow. Beyond that, we have added a lot of security access points to our campuses. We all know over the past uh, several years, there's a lot of information in school safety that has come to light. And one of them is that elementary schools in particular, we really need to maintain control and access so that people who come to our campuses don't uh, get near our students unless we know that they are safe to do so. And so we've added a lot of door access and cameras so our um, folks at the front desk can find out who people are, what they need before they actually grant access to the campus. This is going to be um, a video of Matt Roser, principal at Riverwood Middle School, talking about the safety enhancements to Riverwood as a result of the 2018 bond program. So in Bond 2018, Riverwood acquired this vegetable that I'm standing in here now. This vegetable has allowed us the opportunity to have a safe entry point for all visitors who come on campus. Uh, so if the parents here to pick up their child or to have a meeting with someone uh, on campus, uh, this is a great entry point that's safe and secure. They must check, check in with a staff member uh, prior to entry. It gives our staff members time to confirm uh, their appointment uh, before entry into the building. So this addition has really impacted our safety on campus because it gives our main entry point uh, a boosted uh, checkpoint uh, as visitors come on campus. One of the other big things was our video cameras on campus. Uh, our video cameras give us a great deal of eyes uh, in various parts of the building, uh, both inside and outside. Uh, but those are two of the biggest uh, investments that were made in Bond 2018 that have really enhanced the security here at Riverwood. Then the next item is uh, our Emergency Operations Center, which served us well in Hurricane Harvey, when the cabinet had to gather together and figure out what we were going to do about flooded Kingwood High School, as well as um, other concerns across the school district. And it was, uh, as we have grown, so has our police force. And it's important that they have spaces where they can do training together, as well as roll call. Uh, a lot of things that happen for safety and security in this, this building have evolved over time. And so as a member of the 2018 bond program, we are doing some renovations and upgrades, and we'll have a space for all the officers to gather and do training. And in fact, the new space will actually even have a little room for growth. 
This is Westlake Middle School. So uh, after safety, the other area, there's two more. One is growth and the other is renewal. Growth is all about the fact that Humble ISD is indeed a fast growth school district, meaning that we have a lot of folks who are building and buying homes here and our communities are constantly expanding. Uh, we work with PASA to look at that data and also to adjust our boundaries. But eventually what happens is that we have to build new campuses. And uh, Westlake Middle School is one of those campuses that was done in the 2008 bond. Uh, when we want to open a campus, we have to strike this just right moment between the time where you would open a campus and it would be underutilized versus the time you would open a campus and the other campuses would be too full. So we actually struck a great balance with this campus and opened it nearly at capacity. Um, Centennial Elementary, also part of the 2008 bond, helped alleviate crowding in roughly the same part of the district. Also, um, a, a pretty good upgrade in our safety protocols on this campus where we have additional uh, ways to intervene in keeping an intruder away from our students. Here's some of the interior of Centennial Elementary School. With Centennial, uh, we started thinking a little differently about our elementary campuses. We wanted to make sure that uh, the building itself maximizes the inspiration and the engagement for our students in the learning process. We used to think, you just gather students together, you give them some information, and learning will happen. That's all that you need. But today, we know with more research than ever that motivation and engagement are incredibly important in the learning process and inspire Hiring young children is definitely something that we want to see happen. We want them to have learning spaces that they love, uh, that they're attracted to, uh, and that make them feel safe and happy at school. And so Centennial was our very first step forward in this arena. You'll even see that a little bit inside the classrooms where you see a lot of daylighting, something that we're focused on because we know there's a lot of positive evidence about uh, daylighting being um, a, a positive influence in the learning of students, but also you see a lot of different learning spaces here and the ability of our students to move about and collaborate. One of the uh, POG or Portrait of a Graduate Skills in NBISD is collaboration, innovation, and creativity, and uh, so we are building classrooms that bring those out. This is the Media Center at Centennial. Again, you'll see a lot of collaborative spaces, and our our media folks and our librarians, they have really raised the bar for learning in Umbel ISD. It's no longer uh, just a place where students read books. It's also a place where students engage in Legos, robotics, um, also little bits, which are about electricity and LED lights. Uh, they do coding, and they do so many different things in these spaces. So again, warm, inviting spaces with a lot of different ways for students to gather together and work. Here is Francesca Rathke. She is a teacher at Centennial Elementary School, a former Umbilized Teacher of the Year, talking about the learning spaces at Centennial where she now teaches. So the students have been so engaged in the pods. It's given this amazing opportunity to have light coming in through all of the places and really fun places for students to do independent work or work together um, with the friends in their class. It's just a really amazing place to to learn in. Um, I feel like my brain functions more over here. Like it's more open where you can like be able, you feel free and like you feel like you're learning better like here because it's more space and it's space. It's a blessing to be here and to have this type of school here to help me learn and try to accomplish my goals and my dreams. So yeah. I love it. What more do you want from your students? And they love your spaces to accomplish their goals and their dreams. Exactly right. Along the, uh, same, the same line of thinking on the growth is uh, Elementary School 30, now Autumn Creek Elementary School, named at the last board meeting down in Fall Creek. Again, everyone is well aware that these are our areas of, of the most intense growth in our community. Elementary School will alleviate crowding at both Ridge Creek Elementary as well as Fall Creek Elementary and hopefully um, some trickle effect to Groves Elementary also. This is a pretty exciting campus also. We've really expanded our thinking uh, in what these pods can look like and do. They're aligned to some of our TEKS, which are Texas Education Knowledge and Skills for all students. They're outcomes uh, that students want. we want our students to explore and understand. And so we have aligned some of the learning spaces to the outcomes for their particular grade level, but more importantly, just created really great spots for them to uh, engage in learning and, and think about their futures. Here's a couple more. Uh, you see the dinosaur one on the left, and then the one of my favorites, the Arctic pod on the right. And uh, 
the architects have really hit it out of the park, bringing elements from children's museums into our campuses to really inspire students to think differently and outside the box. Like, I don't know, sitting on ice cubes sounds okay. We're also expanding our thinking on the, on the exterior of the school and on the exterior of the campus with uh, upgrading our playground equipment. And uh, modern day playground equipment, there is a lot of exciting things that you can do. And uh, we wanna make sure that the learning happens on the outside of the school as well as the inside of the school. And we know for our early childhood students that the pre-K, kindergarten, first and second graders, there's a lot of social and emotional development that happens on the playground with teachers watchful eyes nearby. So we want to have toys and playground equipment that inspires that kind of play and gives us an opportunity to teach coping skills and interpersonal skills. Here is our North Transportation Center, also growth, and folks who are in Kingwood are very excited about this because in the past, all of our coaches and all of our teachers for field trips uh, had to have buses that came from Humble. We had only one transportation center, and that required a lot of what we call deadhead miles, meaning the trip from the transportation center to the campus uh, is, is sort of wasted mileage. Well, with this new North Transportation Center much closer to our campuses in the north, it will eliminate roughly $2 million worth of deadhead miles on an annual basis, reoccurring, and we're excited for the financial savings and our, uh, our staff are excited about the proximity. So it's gonna be a beautiful facility. Here is what it looks like today. Uh, you can see that it's, it's going up. It's a lot further along than it was during the groundbreaking. This is the interior where we will have opportunities for bus drivers who are an integral part of our workforce, have unique schedules often uh, where they drive routes in the morning, they might have time in between, they drive routes in the afternoon, field trips, etc. And we want to make sure that they have welcoming spaces that they need as well as training spaces. Here is a Tacita High School additions. Uh, this includes both a 20 classroom addition as well as a third gymnasium. And uh, these are pretty exciting additions for our, our staff and our students because we've created spaces for students to, uh, th similar to the elementary plan, but more age appropriate, uh, less planets hanging around and just more uh, Starbucks-like spaces for our secondary learners. Uh, the third gyms provide a lot of space and opportunity for our fine arts and athletics programs. So dance teams, flag groups, all of those have more spaces to practice indoors and share uh, gymnasium spaces than they did before. Coming soon, also in growth, is middle school number 10. It is a Westlake Middle School uh, repeat design. We save a lot of architectural fees by doing that. But what we do do is as we learn things about a campus after using it for a year or so, we make uh, small changes to the new campus. And so it's even better. It continues to evolve as time goes forward and we get better ideas. And that is the case with this campus also. This will help alleviate some of the crowding at Wood Creek uh, as well as Humble Middle School and uh, perhaps uh, Westlake Middle School also. This is some of the interior renderings, and then you can see on the right that uh, Middle School 10 will be located next to Ridge Creek Elementary School. And so it's kind of a new design for Humble ISD and uh, what is often called a learning village where you have children from pre-K all the way through eighth grade uh, basically sharing one site. Creates a lot of opportunities for learning. Uh, Groves and Westlake are like that also. They have the Insperity Adaptive Sports Complex between them. These are our wood floors. As we built new middle schools, we started adding wood floors to them because sport court floors are sort of a thing of the past and they don't hold up as well. Uh, these are the kind of wood floors that allow our students to prepare for high school athletics, but also uh, they last a little longer, can be refinished. And so as we started to move in this direction in our new campuses, we certainly wanted to put them uh, in our older campuses. And that is the flavor of every project under the category called renewal. So one of my favorite things about the Umble ISD bond is that our community not only supports growth and safety, but they also support the idea that we need to make sure the learning spaces in our older campuses or in our older neighborhoods uh, provide equal opportunities for our students no matter what. Another part of our renewal is the Summer Creek Third Gym, again, adding that additional space for fine arts and athletics so that we can fit everybody in, ROTC, uh, cheerleading, whoever needs gymnasium space, we can schedule it in with all of these new uh, third gyms that will be going in all of our high schools. Here's Lakeland Elementary School, uh, obviously under the, under the heading of renewal, as Lakeland was our oldest elementary campus. I believe Mr. Sitton went to Lakeland Elementary School. Yeah. <laughs> back in the day. And uh, 
you know, when you start to look at some of our older campuses, we have to do an analysis. And that analysis looks at everything from the chillers, the roofs, the flooring, everything about that campus. And if we were to replace it and bring it all up to date, what would be the cost of that? And then we look at the total replacement cost. If the cost to update is a large percentage of the total replacement cost, then we start to look at replacement. And the other reason we look at replacement is because if it's just not possible to bring a facility up to a modern standard, then the right thing to do is to replace the facility with a modern facility. And I'm very excited about this campus. I think it's, it's a beautiful site uh, next to Turner Stadium. It's a, it's a fairly wooded site, and this campus has a lot of really new thinking. Here's what it looks like today. I can't believe how fast it's going up. Um, when we started this process, I thought, oh, fall 2021, that's gonna be scary, but here it goes. Uh, I'm feeling optimistic that we're going to be ready. The inside of this school, the tree house is loved by everyone. Um, as you come in here, you see the, uh, the library behind the tree house. Uh, special spaces for students are inside and outside this campus. The, this particular campus has a, a performing arts wheel. We do this at two different campuses. It's a new program for us where, and I think that uh, many of you may have seen those fifth grade violinists here at the holidays, and they were from Lakeland, uh, part of this program. And so when this school was designed, the architects created a stage that sits between the cafeteria, which is a really well lit, lovely space, and the gymnasium on the left. And between the two is a stage. Well, this stage is a 360 stage and we'll have two front rows so that when those performances are happening, uh, those violinist parents can have front row seats on both sides uh, of the cafeteria and the gymnasium. This is Guy M. Sconzo Early College High School, formerly known as Quest Early College High School, one of the highest performing early college high schools in the state of Texas. And Quest has always uh, been with, uh, been a roommate. <laughs> they've, always, they've always been a roommate to another campus or another facility. They've never had their own space. Um, with, the, with the conversation we've had with our students around CTE and our students telling us that they really want their CTE programs located on their home campuses to eliminate the travel time and make it much more convenient for them, we were given the opportunity to take the current CTE facility and renovate it with an addition and uh, give Quest Early College High School, now Guy M. Sconzo Early College High School, its own uh, very own campus and space. And so here are the interior renderings of this campus a college-like atmosphere, look and feel, because these students engage in college-level work all day, and a huge percentage, over 90%, graduate with their AA degree at the end, as well as their high school diploma. This is the Northern Ag Science Center, um, and the reason it's under renewal is because the Southern Ag Center is uh, is part of the renewal program. So we're, we're building a brand new Northern Ag Center because the current one sits 14 feet below the floodplain. And every time it rains hard, we have to evacuate all of the animals, uh, which is a, is a heavy lift. And frankly, it's an aged facility that was deeply um, bruised by Hurricane Harvey. And it was time. So we've worked together with FEMA uh, on a number of projects, including this one. And we're building a brand new Northern Ag facility up next to the new Northern Transportation Facility. But in that whole spirit of wanting to make sure all students have great opportunities, we are modernizing and improving the South Ag facility also. So the South, both the South and the North will have these show arenas and facilities, uh, as well as the North will have brand new pens that are larger than the current pens, uh, which is an upgrade for the animals and a good thing. Here is Senior Brooke Burkhalter uh, talking with us a little bit about the Ag program and the new Ag facilities. The biggest takeaway, you know, I'm a senior. I have been using an arena that's grass, that has mud puddles in it. I'm having to avoid that. You know, my pig's running all over the place. Now I actually get to use an arena where it's clean. I get to walk my pig. I get to practice my showmanship just how I would here. And I made sale for my first time my senior year. I haven't done that any other year, and I think it's because of that arena. These students that raise these animals each and every year work very, very hard, but sometimes they don't have the facilities to work their animals, whether that's walking their pig, driving their sheep or their goat, walking their steer. Sometimes the facilities that they had were not the best quality, and days like a rainy day would kind of offset their practicing. So from where we were 
to where we are now. The facilities that we have really gave those students some real world experience on what they would have out in the real show arena. And it all paid off because these students wouldn't be where they are today without those facilities that were built for them and for those future students. So it's a large upgrade, and we're excited about that. Um, the students have actually uh, been able to use the South facility uh, and have really enjoyed that. Coming soon, 2021, multi-purpose rooms, gr gyms, groups one and two. So um, as you know, we build new elementary schools with gymnasiums. I just showed you uh, Lakeland Elementary School's rendering. You saw the gym off to the left. Uh, we didn't used to do that. And many of our current existing uh, elementary schools have those pavilions. And uh, again, under the concept of renewal and making sure that all children have opportunities to learn that are similar uh, based on the facilities that they have, uh, we are building multi-purpose rooms on all of our campuses that do not currently have gyms. We organize these in a way that uh, maximizes the taxpayer dollar and our own resources because we grouped our elementary schools according to their prototype, which allowed our architects then to do one design for multiple schools and, and allows our construction folks to do the same. And so group one is prototype one, group two is prototype two, and group three is prototype three, which will be coming up here shortly. These provide a lot of opportunities, not just for our elementary schools and students, uh, but also for community partnerships. We added a few bleachers in here for our students to sit on when they're in gym class or for class meetings or a lot of different opportunities, but it would also allow for small or youth groups to uh, have competitions with spectators. And here are those lucky groups in group one and two who are uh, on the way to having their new multi-purpose rooms. And you may have noticed that the, the image I showed was sort of a red brick image, but each one of these will be matched to the current facility. Here is under renewal, Humble High School, our original number one high school. And uh, this is, looks a lot different than Humble High School does today, does it not? Uh, we're very excited about this. This is about a $35 million renovation. Uh, it will bring Humble High School up to what we would consider our modern standards for high school and instruction and education. Uh, many folks who are watching this were on the, uh, the CBAC committee, the Citizens Bond Advisory Committee, and we actually met at Humble High School every time. And so they're going to recognize the difference between the current cafeteria, the current auditorium, and these images, uh, the daylighting, the high ceilings, the collaborative wide open spaces, the modernization. Uh, there's a lot of things happening here that are very exciting. And if you didn't see it, you should see the inspiring moments uh, where the Humble High School, a few of their students, uh, got to see these renderings and their reactions were priceless, talking about how they were so glad uh, that we didn't forget them that we paid attention and uh, that goes back to my pride for this community and the culture of Humble ISD to care about all students and all campuses with growth, safety and renewal. Humble High School will also get a brand new competition gym. So uh, you're gonna think that I'm being really repetitive, but that is, the, that is the theme here, is that when your facilities are not up to par with all the other facilities, then it is our goal to improve them and make it to be so. And the competition gymnasium at Humble High School certainly wasn't uh, up to the standards of some of our others, so we are going to build a brand new competition gym as part of this renovation. Uh, and they will also have three gyms in total. This will be uh, a new competition competition gym instead of a new third gym like you saw in some of the other images. And this is uh, part of the entrance area to that new gym. This is the new elevation for Kingwood High School. So you all remember we had a $65 million putback of Kingwood High School after Hurricane Harvey. FEMA required us to put it back the way it was and frankly we were on a really tight timeline because our students and our staff, our families and community needed those 23 buses to not be going down Westlake Houston Parkway every day and needed us to not be sharing campuses. So we were working really fast to get Kingwood High School back in its home and, and we put the campus back. But with this opportunity of the addition of a third gym and CTE facilities, uh, we are also going to modernize the exterior of the campus and bring it up to uh, the standards that we have for our new campuses also. You see a little brick staining there too. If you've, if you've seen Kingwood High School, you know that uh, Hurricane Harvey was not kind to those light bricks. And so we have a plan to, uh, to make those look new again. Uh, this is the entrance to the third gym, Kingwood High School. Uh, again, you can see that uh, one thing that happens when you uh, renovate older campuses is that you can get a Frankenstein effect. 
meaning you can really tell where the additions are. Some things don't match up quite right. It just looks a little funny. The layouts are funny. And so we've worked really hard with our architects to make these comprehensive plans and make sure that all parts of the building fit together, old and new. These are the entrances to the, uh, the gym area that you just saw. And they're a lot like the Atascita um, student collaborative spaces where students have places that they can meet up and um, have lunch. You know, we, we have one lunch, and at least we had one lunch. We hope to go back to it someday. <laughs> um, but we want spaces for students that are friendly and welcoming and easily supervised. This is another view of that same area from a different angle. This is Kingwood Park. Um, the same exact kind of renovation is happening there with an addition of a third gym and uh, significant CTE renovations and updates and also a modernization of their front entrance. This is the new gym, the third gym at Kingwood Park. Uh, and it looks a lot like the third gyms at Summer Creek and Atascita. We are building those all to be very similar. Now this is going to be uh, the KHS flood mitigation strategy, and what you're going to see is how these flood walls work. Uh, PBK Architects brought us uh, quite a long time ago, you'll probably remember, a rendering of the flood mitigation, and it sort of bricked up some of our windows, and, and it did some things that we just weren't excited about because it took us in the wrong direction. That's, that's not how we want our facilities to be for our students. It certainly doesn't match our new facilities. So we've been working with them and with FEMA since then. It's been a wonderful partnership. Uh, to maintain the daylighting and maintain the modern spaces in Kingwood and still make this building flood proof, like a reverse aquarium. So if you were inside during a flood, you would see the water come up, but it would not make it inside. That's exactly what we're working on. This is the same technology uh, that they have at the National Archives and also uh, the Medical Center. And the other thing I think is important to note is uh, I have had the opportunity to visit with uh, the superintendent in Galveston, and after Ike, they put some flood proofing in some of their campuses, but they have to manually set it up and manually take it down. So if they believe there's a hurricane and that they have to put their flood proofing in place, they have to shut the campus down a day in advance, they have to put the floodgates up, then after the hurricane has passed, they have to keep the school shut down and they have to take the floodgates down. What's beautiful about this design uh, that PBK and FEMA have worked together on uh, is a couple of things. One, these gates go up automatically, and you're going to see that water comes into these troughs. These gates come up on their own. There will never be shutting down the school to put gates up and down. And the other thing is that this will not cost Umbel ISD any dollars. This will be paid for through FEMA and the state of Texas. Uh, these are not part of the 2018 bond, but we are doing it in collaboration with the other projects happening there. have to say that I hope that I never see those work, but, <laughs> but I will feel much better when they're there. I know Nolan will too. <laughs> okay, this is multi-purpose room group three. This is prototype three. This is the Bear Branch Woodland Hills uh, prototype, and they will be receiving multi-purpose rooms uh, slash gyms, uh, just like all of their counterparts in groups one and two. This is the members of group three, and you will notice that those campuses are all very similar. And Kingwood Middle School is part of renewal. Uh, when we did our facility assessment study, it was clear to us that upgrading Kingwood Middle School, the cost far outweighed the benefit, and it was a campus that absolutely needed to be demolished and rebuilt. And uh, that's a very challenging thing to do on site, but uh, together, Kirksey Architects and um, Flint Co. contractors are making that happen, and Kingwood Middle School is currently underway. Uh, one of the things you'll notice about this campus is that uh, the architects worked really hard to bring the livable forest inside. Uh, one of the sort of things about Kingwood that a lot of people love are the trees and the natural light, the, uh, the sort of natural colors uh, and natural effects like stone and wood. And so you'll see that all through this campus, making it really a timeless campus, uh, a calm and, and good place for middle school students. 
This is the Learning Commons, again, much more than a library. And then on every single floor, uh, this is a three-story campus because, uh, you know, ground space you have to build up. And um, these are student collaboration spaces, a lot like the elementary ones minus the dinosaurs. Um, but these are spaces for middle school students, age appropriate for them, where they can collaborate, work together, and uh, innovate. This is the site for New North Belt Elementary School. Now, you might remember that North Belt Elementary School was not part of the 2018 bond, and there was a lot of conversation that it should be the very first campus for the 20-whatever bond at the time. We didn't know what year that might be. Um, but as we worked through the process of evaluating North Belt, it became clear to us that the current site was just not viable, that we could not rebuild on site or even renovate that campus and bring it up to our modern standards. So we immediately began looking for a new site for North Belt and found a beautiful site, heavily treed site, and we were able to use their um, budget allocation for their multi-purpose room to purchase this land for North Belt Elementary School. One of the things that I think is so great about this is that uh, what has happened as a result of COVID and ex excellence in construction management, uh, excellence in timing, uh, refunding of bonds, just everything came together in a way that is allowing us to build North Belt Elementary School as part of a 2018 bond program, even though this campus was not part of that. And so when principal of North Belt Elementary School started to meet with the architects and talk about those collaborative spaces, she said, you know, a lot of my students don't get the opportunity to travel. So I really want this campus to take them places. I want them to experience the world. And so PVK Architects is in process right now of creating biomes uh, that will be interesting and magical and take students of North Belt Elementary School all over the world every day when they are on campus. This is an interior rendering of new North Belt and uh, sticking with timeless, classic, natural, inviting and warm, those are the things you're gonna hear about our elementary schools because research has shown us uh, that those are the kind of places that are calming and inviting to students. Uh, and then along with that talk of, about how COVID and other things have benefited us, this is actually a stacking bar that I really love. Uh, thank you to Andrew for putting this together for me. Um, it shows you every single project the savings that we have generated on that project and how those savings had, have added up to allow us to build North Belt Elementary School in the 2018 bond program. CTE campus renovations, again, with the conversation with our students that led us to understand that they would be best served by programs on their home campuses where they don't have to drive. Um, we also have actually surveyed them about, okay, so if you want programs on your campus, which programs do you want on your campus? And then we have used those data to create these CTE renovations and additions on our high school campuses. Uh, you probably remember there was a $15 million allocation in the bond for CTE, and this is exactly where it's going. Uh, Atascita High School will have a Cisco lab, which is a computer networking uh, kind of thing, a pharmacy lab, and a robotics lab. This is going to be our pharmacy tech teacher uh, very graciously explaining how wonderful her new classroom uh, for farm tech is going to be. Hi, my name is Bridget Wargolette. I am a full-time teacher here at Humboldt ISD. I teach pharmacy technician classes, and I'm also a part-time pharmacy technician. And I'm here to show you my awesome new pharmacy tech lab that the students will be enjoying in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'm just so excited for what this is going to do for our program. Um, as you can tell, we've made a mock pharmacy. They're going to be able to actually experience what it's like to be a technician in a pharmacy, what it looks like, what it sounds like. Um, and they're going to get to come in their scrubs and actually use this pharmacy lab as good first real world experience. My old classroom is a great space. Um, however, it's not 
built to function as a pharmacy. Um, we're storing our vials in tubs and totes. We have empty stock bottles um, in boxes rather than being able to display them and let the students look at them and see them and actually um, uh, use them more frequently. Um, and so this space is going to give me the opportunity to actually um, have these things set up and it's giving me um, and the students the space to actually experience a real pharmacy rather than um, just doing pharmacy work in a classroom setting. It's very exciting to see those CTE spaces come to life. We have a lot of students who go through these programs, receive their certifications, and are working already in, in our local pharmacies and um, in other career fields. Here are uh, here at Humble High School. These are going to be their CTE additions and renewals, a nursing lab and a computer tech lab. Those were completed in 2020 and coming in 2021, this is very exciting, is a brand new cosmetology salon with an outward facing entrance that improves the safety and security of that facility and also creates a public space uh, for people to come and, and enjoy those services. Uh, we've also been working with Memorial Herman uh, as they are very interested in putting right next door to this um, a health clinic for our uh, students uh, to access from all the campuses that are on that Turner Complex, Humble High School, Ross Sterling Middle School, Lakeland Elementary School, and uh, Sconzo Early College High School would all have access to a community clinic. It would also be a CTE rotation site for our students, uh, and Larkin is very excited about that opportunity also because we are always looking for uh, clinical sites for our students. And then this is at Kingwood High School. We are going to be building a nursing lab in 2022. It's a CTE addition on kind of on the back side of the school. Um, that's difficult to see, but it's a great space and, and has a lot of that daylighting that a lot of our other classrooms at Kingwood simply don't have yet. Uh, Kingwood Park High School coming in 2022, a criminal justice courtroom, which is very exciting, a culinary lab. I'm super excited for the culinary lab with the little bistro down there, and the Tiny Homes Workshop. And you've probably saw Tiny Homes on uh, Good Morning America and all of those things. What they do for uh, veterans is really phenomenal. CTE campus renovations at Summer Creek include a criminal justice courtroom that is complete and a robotics lab that's complete. And what's coming next is their tiny homes outdoor lab. And Charles Street Stadium. This was a big conversation uh, for the Citizens Bond Advisory Committee. They were very passionate that it was time for Charles Street Stadium to be upgraded, that those facilities need to be renewed, and that we needed to have a wonderful sub-varsity facility for Humble High School, and as well as many soccer matches, et cetera, that take place here. So we're very excited to see Charles Street Stadium. This will be the sub-varsity facility for Humble High School. We'll be branded that way and have turf like all of their counterparts. So here are the opening dates for all of these different major projects. You can see we have tagged them as either growth, renewal, or safety, just like the slides. And one of the things that you can plainly see is that in 2018, we passed the bond, and you can see that in 2019 and 20, we were allowed to get a couple things done, smaller projects, but we really ramped up on our major projects during those two years, and uh, we are have a lot of opening dates in 2021, so it's a very exciting time in our bond. And uh, when we had this conversation uh, with the bond committee, uh, we talked about you know four to five years or so, and you can see that absolutely coming to fruition here with all of the uh, additional major projects opening in 2022. The other thing I love is when you look at it, um, we have this lovely Tableau program that allows us to put a map of the district up there with the location of each and every project. And um, this is really a community-wide bond. This is a bond that serves and supports every single community inside Umbel ISD and every single uh, group of students that we have. Doesn't matter if it's about growth or renewal or safety, uh, we have things going on just about everywhere. So on the financial side of this, um, as I said earlier, we were very, very committed and very important to the, the board as well as the staff that we maintain our, our tax rate and that we not have any bonds with more than a 30-year rate and um, that we would retire debt sufficient to, to maintain our tax rate. So it's really important as we sequence projects and we sell bonds and we retire debt, it's all this sort of orchestrated dance to make it all work really, really well together. 
At the same time, there's a lot of estimating that goes into all of this work. So at the time the bond was passed, we were thinking we were going to be working around interest rates of about 4%. And we also had to figure inflation into all of our projects because the worst case scenario for us would be to realize higher interest rates or higher inflation rates and not be able to afford all of the projects that we put on the actual bond that was voted on. So we do a lot of work with experts in these arenas to make sure that we're paying attention to both the interest rates as well as um, as the uh, inflation, so that we're well within that with all of our projects. And because interest rates have come down and because uh, we have seen such a, a low rate of inflation on materials, et cetera, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, that is part of why North Belt Elementary School has been able to be realized, as well as excellence in, uh, in construction project management, bidding all of those parts of the process. A another thing that's important on this slide uh, is that $137 million uh, is going to be, our bond repayments will be $137 million less than we expected because of favorable interest rates. Now, some folks may think, oh good, then we have an extra $137 million laying around that we can use to do stuff, but that's not the case. Uh, this just allows us to manage our tax rate better and sets us up really well for a future referendum uh, that will allow us to, again, sell bonds and stay within that tax rate, but the $135 million is, is not available. So this is just another chart showing that we were expecting a 4% interest rate and we've achieved about on average a 2.78% interest rate and that's where that $137 million of interest savings on the repayment comes. And this is a slide to show that when we did a comprehensive facility ass uh, assessment and study uh, and we asked everybody, give us everything that you think needs to happen, every chiller, boiler, roof, carpet, paint, uh, you name it, it's in here at $1.7 billion. And then we, we, we brought that down uh, to $1.2 billion, and that was considered by the CBAC, the, the Citizens Bond Advisory Committee. And then they ultimately, after they weighed all of those things, moved forward so, uh, $575 million uh, that the board moved forward to the ballot. Here are the bond sale dates so that you can see uh, when we sold what. And again, there's a bit of an art to this because it's about not selling bonds you don't need, but selling them in time to not slow down your projects and being able to service the debt within your tax rate uh, and sequence the project as such. And uh, our team has done a phenomenal job with this. Uh, you'll see that the remaining bonds to be sold, about $100 million remain to get us to the full $575 million. So what are we doing right now? Well, we're completing all of those projects that you saw all over the map that have to be completed in 21 and 22, and we're starting a um, update of our facility assessment study. We're bringing in the unifier study, we're bringing in all the information that we have, there's a couple different things that happened during the last several years. Sometimes we have a chiller on a certain program and we don't expect it to be replaced until a certain date and time, but that chiller it goes down and we have to replace it now. So we need to update those items in the facility assessment, take it out of the rotation where it was, put it where it needs to be. We also need to check off all the things that we've completed in the 2018 bond or will complete. Uh, we want to have all of this updated and complete by this summer for review by uh, the senior staff in the cabinet, all the department leaders, all the campus leaders, so that we can then, guess what, move it forward to another citizens bond advisory committee. This fall, fall 2021 in September, we would like to invite the community back together to not only celebrate the 2018 bond, which I truly believe is an absolute celebration. It's a celebration of learning and innovation, of maximizing taxpayer dollars, of maintaining and reducing interest rates, um, being absolutely fiscally sound. Uh, it's a celebration in so many different ways, bringing together construction experts with education experts in the best interest of children. We'll be able to see the faces of those Lakeland First graders, as they come into those brand new spaces uh, this fall, that's gonna be like a highlight of my very long career <laughs> uh, to see that. And um, we would like to invite the community together to discuss what's next for us, where, where do we go from here? 
while we've been doing the 2018 bond, of course we have ideas. We, we, things come up on our radar and we start to contemplate them and measure them against uh, where we'd like to go. And some of these items are a replacement for Foster Elementary School, our oldest elementary in Kingwood. Second gyms at middle schools that do not currently have them. We build all of our new middle schools with two gyms and our existing only have one. Uh, uh, we've contemplated an early childhood center. This is actually something that the Citizens Bond Advisory Council contemplated last time, decided not to put forward. Uh, but as we have done boundaries, enrollment, and really considered uh, where are the best ways to put children in the district so that we don't overbuild, we don't underbuild, one of the things that's come up is uh, perhaps over by River Pines, an early childhood center would alleviate some crowding in those area schools, which will experience growth in the next few years with the development of Harmony Cove and a few other areas. If we take those early childhood programs into an early childhood center, we generate additional classroom space on our current facilities and don't require to build in another elementary school. Uh, virtual learning studios, this was something that we were not thinking about until last March. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, uh, virtual learning is here in the state of Texas. It's serving some of our students very well. So we want to make sure that if we're going to keep it, we do it absolutely the best. Um, that is who we are as a school district. If we're going to do it, we, if we're going to offer it, we want it to be excellent. And so to that end, we want to make sure that our teachers and our students have the kind of spaces they need to be successful in virtual learning. You know, we started in March with, with iPhones and Zoom and, and not much else. And we've progressed. We have Schoology and Seesaw. We have a Google Classroom. We've handed out thousands of Chromebooks. I mean, we've done a lot of things well. But having a teacher teach remotely or virtually in a regular classroom, 700 square feet with 20 desks, doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't have the technology they need, um, and, it, and it doesn't make sense in the use of space. So we're really uh, in the process of piloting a virtual learning studio at the ISC. We'll learn from that space, and then we will think about where those virtual learning studios might go in the future, particularly after we have data from our families this spring telling us who plans to stay virtual next year. Daylighting, this is a big topic of conversation and it's one that we really care about. We have some schools with very limited daylighting um, uh, because of their age and time when they were built and we want to remedy that. So we will be looking at daylighting very seriously. Ross Sterling Middle School is the next candidate in our middle schools for a replacement. Um, that is one of those campuses that, uh, the only campus on that entire Turner complex that will not have been renovated after this bond. Uh, so it is a likely candidate for a, a complete renovation or redo. Um, and then elementary updates. You saw those, those children museum pod designs that bring the learning to life. And although we can't do that exactly the same in our existing campuses, we certainly can make um, a, a good run at adding those kind of spaces for our elementary students that, that don't attend our new campuses. What's our future potential? Well, the experts are estimating that we would have $500 million in future bond potential, uh, and that would not raise our tax rate, so we would be able to continue with safety, growth, and renewal, and humble ISD for all children, uh, maintaining the current tax rate with $500 million in new projects. And we are in the process of propping up some new website space so everybody can clearly see uh, how those major projects are going. Because one of the things that we said from the beginning and we really are committed to is we want to keep our promises. We promised to do things and we made good on every single one of those or in the process of making good on them. And so we're going to make that abundantly clear on our website. We even updated the Atassi to High School 10 classroom edition to 20 because that is ultimately what we built. Here's a few more. That's why I have so many shovels. Yeah. We've, so we've done everything we said we were going to do and a lot more. We did 20 classrooms at Atascita High School instead of 10. We built the uh, guy, well we are building, the Guy M. Sconzo Early College High School. We built that out of fund balance because it made absolute sense to do so. Uh, we wanted a comprehensive plan for all of our high schools and this is how uh, we brought that forward. And we're replacing the 53 year old North Belt Elementary School with a brand new campus. They'll bring learning li to life for those children. It will accommodate their performing arts wheel and they will have learning pods that take them all over the world. Could you just explain to everyone what uh, is meant by uh, the fund balance funded? Sure. Because it might not, yeah. 
So uh, in, our, in our general operating fund, we have dollars that are, um, it's, it's sort of difficult to explain, but it's like a savings account. And it's one-time money, money that we saved because utility prices went down or we didn't use as many bus miles and we had extra fuel uh, dollars available. And those dollars fall to what we call the fund balance. And it's a savings account for the school district. It's uh, money that we set aside for emergencies, but also uh, for things like this particular expense where it just makes sense for us to do this project, but it wasn't technically in the 2018 bond. And at the time when we chose to do it, we didn't know if we would have dollars available to do it out of savings from the bond. And so we used the dollars from the fund balance. Um, Umbel ISD has an exceptional uh, fund balance, excellent financial uh, transparency and efficiency. Uh, most school districts work to achieve a 25% fund balance. You hear that every year when Laura Hamm presents the, the state award to Umbel ISD. We have more than that, and during Hurricane Harvey, that served us very well. We were able to use fund balance dollars to pay contractors who could have worked anywhere in the city of Houston that day and came immediately to Kingwood High School to start pumping out disgusting water and probably saved that building from a complete demolish. Uh, if that water had sat in there for weeks on end, um, we would have had a significant mold issue in areas that we didn't have to change. Uh, we would have had to, our environmental uh, testing would have far exceeded where we had to go. We took it to the metal uh, studs and down to the slab who knows how far we would have had to go if we wouldn't have immediately had Blackman Mooring in there and then facility sources. So that fund balance has served Umbel ISD very well. It did again this year uh, with COVID and the COVID expenses ordering millions of dollars of PPE uh, and, and many of the other things that we've had to do to make it work for our students and staff uh, through COVID. And so um, we have been financially sound and 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 it's, it pays off for our students and our staff and our district in the long run. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. Uh, any other questions or comments from uh, members of the board? Ms. Lamont Dixon. Yeah, I just have one comment. I mean, I, you know, of course, I'm on the building and planning committee, so I've gotten to see a lot of this firsthand, but just, I, I'm just really proud of our entire team in Humble ISD, especially in making sure we have equity in our facilities. And it really sets what our district standard is. And so I just wanted to make note of that. Thank you. Great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. I also would like to recommend the, the public that we did have time for public comment uh, prior to the presentation. If you do have additional questions, uh, please address those to Dr. Fagan, and uh, and she'll get it to the right person on the team. Uh, Mr. Scarfo. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. And first, I just want to thank you uh, and the committee, because I know it was uh, something that we talked about, and I had asked that we could start doing some things uh, publicly uh, in terms of our committee work. So thank you for, as chair of the committee, and, and Ms. Dixon and uh, Ms. Morrison uh, for, uh, on the committee, for making this happen, I appreciate that a lot. And um, I wanted to, and maybe Mr. Sitton, if you could just maybe spend a few minutes, um, I have two questions for Dr. Fagan about some of the things, you want, but after that, if you could maybe just spend a few minutes about how the Building and Planning Committee works so people understand what, what you guys are doing representing the board team mm -hmm. uh, in that committee work and how that information comes to us and how we're made aware of, of what is going on because it's a lot of, a lot of dollars, a lot of impact on mm -hmm. student growth and, and uh, uh, learning. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, just okay. if you can do that. Sure. Uh, Dr. Fagan, I said just a couple of questions on uh, the elementary schools. I mean, those are great and, and you know, being able to see some of those firsthand and out there um, uh, is really neat. But I wonder, are we, are we planning to set aside any funds for those, um, uh, the build outs in the different schools, because I'm just thinking ahead, I mean, uh, I may not even be alive by then, but 10, 15 years from now, they're not gonna look like <laughs> they look now, so is there, do we plan for that? And, um, and the other question I have is the new buildings that we're putting up, and uh, you know, I've heard this from people like, wow, you know, you guys have to knock down a building and put one up and it's only 40 years old, you know, how come? Uh, why can't you get a building to last more than 40 years? They do that in the, in the private sector. And, and yeah, there's, there's some credence to that argument, but I also understand 
um, as you uh, talked about how sometimes you just can't, you can't get it to where you need it to be. But I just wonder like with these new buildings, do we have an estimate for how long we think they'll be in service? You know, and so I'll leave it at that. Thank well, you. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, we used to build what we called 100 year buildings, but we're, you know, we're power users of buildings. And um, the other thing is the standards really change as far as spaces go and HVAC systems and roofs and uh, daylighting and window quality and um, also uh, energy efficiency. I mean, there's just so many things. Technology is changing so quickly that it makes it really difficult to have a 100-year facility. Um, you know, when you have a 50-year facility, you're pretty proud of yourself that you've uh, that you've had a 50-year facility. You maintained that space for that long. Um, so, are these 50-year facilities? I would I would have to defer to the experts on that. I'm sure PBK would say that they're you know 50, 60, 75-year facilities. But um, I think that the reality is that you have to just monitor as it as the world changes if that facility can keep up with it or if it can't. And sometimes. We put too much money into an old facility trying to get it to a certain place. And at the end of the day, we look back and say, wow, we, we could have built a brand new one for that. And so I think that the new facilities in these cases are going to serve us really well. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. All right, Mr. Scarfo, to answer your other question about how our committee structure works and what exactly does building and planning do. Um, so, the way we have chosen uh, in Humble ISD, as, as you all know, is, is we divide the work. Um, we have committees of three, so we never have a quorum at any of our committee meetings. The idea is to, to receive the information from the administration um, and then to, to vet it, if you will. Uh, so anytime something comes back to the, to the board for, a, for approval, if you will, has been vetted by a committee of three. What makes building and planning unique um, is it's, it's almost a collaborative committee with the finance committee, which you chair. So when, when they're bringing things to building and planning, we're asking questions um, about bond funds, which have already been vetted from the finance committee. We're asking questions about the, the bond study. Uh, where did this fit, on, fit in on that continuum? Um, our job is not to dictate who designs a building or builds a building or, or necessarily when, but to vet the timing of that, pro of that project uh, and vet the process that went in uh, to determine an architect or to, de to determine a, uh, a general contractor, if you will. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a very efficient manner of doing business uh, uh, within the school district for uh, over two decades now. And uh, so uh, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that we're making decisions in committee, because we don't. It's more of a vetting process. It's a way to uh, diversify the work. And that way, when something comes to the board for approval, you know it's been fully vetted by uh, a group of your peers. And, um, um, and, you know, in the past, as you know, we've had some dissension within a, within a committee before. And uh, so that give, gives us the opportunity to, to discuss it here at the dais uh, and then make um, uh, a decision as a group uh, to move forward on a project. Thank you. You bet. You bet. Uh, Dr. Fagan, I have one question. Something that I've been, uh, a couple of questions I've been getting uh, during the course of this process. And, and in my binder here, I always carry the, the, uh, the Citizens Bond Committee's uh, recommendation. And so I can always go back and say, yes, they voted on, uh, they, they recommended this. This is when it was set to, to be completed. And sometimes those dates move around a little bit. Um, as far as like the, the, the P1s and the P2.1s and things like that, how do, how do those things go from the campus level to fruition uh, as far as a recommendation? Uh, so like um, if, if, um, if a choir teacher needs, needs some things on their campus and 
Uh, I mean, it might have been embedded in a 2.1 or a librarian or something. Kind of, how does that work? So the way that it works is that as PBK um, architects travel from campus to campus and department to department, those uh, expert users say, you know, I think our kiln is, is probably done and it's a, it's a big budget item. So uh, we believe that that should be a, oh, we had a little technology glitch there. Um, we believe that that should be something in consideration as part of a bond package. And so what happens is we gather up all those items and then what happens is they're grouped by department leader. And then because we don't have enough dollars, so in the 2.1s and the 1s, we didn't have enough money to do all of them. And so we prioritize the, the priority 1s, those are the safety items, and those get done uh, in the bond. And then what we say is to a Kenny Kendrick, who's in charge of all the roofs and all the chillers, all the boilers, all the, uh, the carpet and the paint, we say, here's the list, and you'll need to prioritize these in order, and then you'll then you'll get your percentage of the 2.1 money according to your total. So this is really confusing, but of all the 2.1s, 65%-ish were Kenny Kendricks. They belonged in his department because of the expense of um, control systems like, um, I can't think of, Unify does, Automated Logic. So there's a lot of things in there, fire and alarm systems, there's all this stuff. And so we say, okay, of the X millions of dollars, then we only have this much available, so 65% of what we have available goes to this list of stuff, and then Kenny, you're responsible to prioritize every one of those items and then be able to demonstrate why you picked that over that and show progress on that entire list. And so we've really put the, the um, responsibility in the hands of the experts uh, who have to make those tough decisions. It also gives Kenny the flexibility to say, well, that chiller over there no longer works. I don't know why, we have to completely replace it. So I need to move it up on the list um, and make that happen real time so we don't have any kind of delay for a campus who needs something immediately. We had a couple of facilities that needed seal, like to be sealed around all the windows and doors and all this, which sounds like a minor thing, and it's a really big thing, uh, particularly in a place with a lot of moisture and rain like we have. And so Kenny obviously prioritized that way up because he wanted to eliminate any kind of um, dampness in the campus and was able to move those projects forward. So he's the expert in that arena, so he receives the percentage of dollars to his department and his projects uh, based on the overall number in the entire list from the facility assessment. I know that's confusing. But, it's <laughs> but it really worked yeah. uh, very well in this particular one. So the fire alarm guy gets his percent and the, you know, and on and on we go. Fine arts gets their percent. Uh, they chose to do a lot of theater lighting in this particular bond um, because it needed to be all transitioned to LED for a variety of reasons. So again, those experts have their whole list of items and they prioritize it. They spend their dollars and they're accountable for them. So if, um, I know you mentioned that a, a potential future future bond referendum, if I'm a, uh, if I have a program in the district and I feel like that I need, I'm gonna need some, some potential bond money to renovate my CTE program or, or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, Cause I know there's a lot of staff probably watching this mm -hmm. uh, and that have some of these questions. What would, you, what would you tell them to start doing now to prepare for a year from now or two years from now? So our message has been to department leaders, we're starting with department leaders and principals, is to start make that list. Go through your campus, go through your program, and look at the items uh, that you believe would benefit students that you've seen in other places that would create learning opportunities. And, and we've been honest in saying, obviously safety items are gonna get the highest priority, and then from there we want, we want items that are, um, are necessary and also aligned to the goals and vision of the district. And so if you have things like that, put that list together. What happens then 
is PBK Architects will go from department to department, meet with every department leader, collect all of their stuff, their prioritized list. Nolan and I are smarter this time than we were last time, so we're having proactive prioritization. <laughs> so we'll get those prioritized lists for every department. So for CTE, Larkin Lesur will have a list, and he will know what his number one priority is all the way through. I, I already know that Larkin's going to have a bunch of middle school CTE renovations so that the programs can matriculate up to those new high school programs. So that conversation's already happening. Uh, I know Destry Balch has a huge list of needs in fine arts, particularly for storage. As those programs have grown and developed, they don't have any place to store their stuff. And so there's, there's needs for storage uh, in fine arts. I know there are other needs also, but um, those department leaders are already talking with their teachers, the people that do the work with students every day and collecting that information and gonna turn that over to PBK. The next level will be uh, Trey Kramer, Donnie Bodron, Lucy Schultz will meet with uh, PBK and their principals to then talk about campus needs and collect that list of items. And then PBK will take our uh, brainstormed list of major projects plus the department list plus the campus list and we will have an update to the facility assessment. Perfect. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Dr. Fagan, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Correa and your group, thank you. And uh, Mike Seal and, and Billy Beatty and y'all's group with the work you've done with the bond funds and with FEMA. Uh, it's a true collaborative effort to get us to this point. Uh, I hope that those that are in the audience and those that have watched this uh, as it was live stream really uh, got a, a full grasp of, of how promises made and promises kept uh, has happened over the last few years. Uh, a lot of work has been done, some behind the scenes like chillers and HVAC systems and so forth, but a lot of construction projects. Uh, uh, Mr. Scarfo, I know that you were uh, the main catalyst to have a few of these workshops like this. So um, I think that uh, Dr. Fagan and her team uh, uh, kind of rose to the occasion here and, and, and really achieved what we were looking for. Uh, so with that said, any, any future business uh, that we need to be looking at? All right, not seeing any. Thank you all for being here. It is 8.18, and we're going to close this workshop down.